Hey guys, welcome back. Welcome to Revere Glass. I'm Dustin Revere, and today I'm gonna to be working with my friend Sam Alderson to make a hummingbird feeder recycler rig. This piece is really cool because we got to use Raticello and Illuminati and some pretty cool techniques and rare colors. But before we get into the studio, I just wanted to share with you that the online school is gonna be hosting uh, a workshop with Alderson Glass on construction in April. Please check out the website because we've just updated it so that all the free content is right there and easy to access. So feel free to check that out and explore the workshops coming up and enjoy any of the free content that you'd like. If you'd like to be a member of the online school and have access to everything, you can absolutely try that for free. Uh, there's a free trial going on right now. So please go to revereglass.com if you're interested in connecting with the community or further in your glass education. I've had a lot of fun hosting some students to come out for private glass retreats. If you'd like to come to Berkeley and hang out at the Berkeley Oasis where there's a glass studio, a jewelry studio, and hot tub, and tons of other great amenities to enjoy, send me a message, check out the website, and I would love to have you out for a private glass retreat. Sometimes people ask me about my work or what I'm designing, so if you're interested in collecting any of the things that I make, including the shirts that people ask a lot about, check out dustinrevere.com. I wanna thank our sponsor, Mountain Glass Arts. They have supported the glass community for so long, they have a wonderful new store in Oregon. You should check that out. When I went to their location in Asheville, it was absolutely amazing, like a kid in a candy store. Just like, give me this color tubing and that color tubing. Anyway, we really love Mountain Glass Arts. You guys should check it out. If you're interested, they ship all over the world and they'll help you get started at Blowing Glass. And Happy to answer any questions. Also, of course, if you guys are buying something from Mountain Glass and you mentioned you saw it in a Revere Glass video, I think they'll give you a little discount. All right, you guys, welcome to the studio. Sam is getting warmed up with uh, a filicello. So you came and stopped by here in, and like you had like a, a layover from Australia to Montana and it was, I don't know, like 20 hours or something. How long were you even here? Oh man, we weren't there for long on the way back to Montana. Yeah, it was not just overnight and then until the next evening, so just enough time to make a piece and wanted to get down on something so we made it happen it was cool yeah it was a lot of um a lot of work and not a lot of rest <laughs> no it was a good yeah a good long day like yeah. probably 10 hours just pushed through you know got you guys got good espresso in san francisco you know so that makes it easier yeah so we wanted to, Sam came out like, uh, I guess a couple years ago now, he was one of the first teachers to do an online class um, at Revere Glass School. So yeah, you know, because I'm in Berkeley and, and close to SFO, sometimes people, people are able to stop by for a layover or something and make a piece. So we decided to try to make this uh, recycler and I would use some of my Raticello tubing and Illuminati tubing, and uh, Sam would shape the piece up into one of his hummingbird recyclers. Do you want to let people know what that shape is all about for you? Sure. So I decided to call it hummingbird feeders uh, just because of, I don't know, like a little name that um, something so many people are familiar with. You know, everybody kind of loves hummingbirds, and they're such special magical little animals and like it was one of the first things I ever made out of glass was hummingbirds my teacher had uh, bought a bottom Mylan Townsend DVD where he makes um, dichro pieces and one of those was his dichro hummingbird or hummingbird like dichro wings um, and so that Mylan Townsend sculptural DVD you're probably familiar with it I'd imagine because there was um, or some of his you know instructional stuff that he put out because there wasn't um as much on the internet like there is now you know so i don't know hummingbirds have always been animals that just i thought were cool and then um yeah it was kind of a return to something maybe from my childhood or like something that feels meaningful to me i guess connecting me with nature and like stuff that feels authentic and good to make so I brought that and to try to combine that with the modern recycler function and you know the aspects of functionality and design that people want these days from a dab rig and 
you know, kind of got to combine all that stuff to make something that's cool and people want to use. And yeah, totally. Um, I don't know if you know, but my my dad is super into hummingbirds. And, I didn't uh, know that. I'm, you you knew it, yeah? No, I, yeah, I well, didn't. He, I'm, Oh, okay. Well, yeah, he's uh, he's super into hummingbirds, and I made him this hummingbird feeder because he he goes out every morning and and looks at hummingbirds. He's seventy five now, and so it's really cool uh, to make the piece, especially you know after making him a hummingbird feeder. For him to yeah. Put outside. Well, so many people I think have this connection with hummingbirds. It's been fascinating how well that design just connects with people in this the the symbol or the image of the hummingbird i think is for some reason like my fiance she has a tattoo of a hummingbird i just know like so many people that love these little birds you know i don't know exactly what it is but they're cool and i've been learning a lot more about them since i've been making them in glass like reading about cool facts about them they actually recognize people so like if you have a hummingbird feeder and they know that you fill it up, they'll come outside and like check on you when you walk out the door, or, like check if you're gonna fill it and they'll fly up to your face and like look at you and be like, oh, that's my dude, like that's my human. Huh. Wow. So what are you, I, as far as where you're at with the piece right now, you're just, we're just making some initial components. So this is some crucible pulled tubing that, um, that I made at the old Revere glass years and years ago. And then you got that uh, filicello all kind of domed in there like that. Yeah, Maybe. so that's a piece that that little weld right there I did because normally I would punty on to it and pull off the yeah. clear bubble first. But I just I figured out that I can do it this way and save, you know, a few minutes there just by yeah. welding the right now I'm pulling the clear bubble off so and then you can just strip that remaining clear. Are you worried off the that edge. you're going to tag the wall? Uh huh. And it turns out clean if you make sure that the black um, connects to the color all the way around. So as you go around and just remove any extra clear, then it turns out nice, like a pretty good little Encalmo cup. Yeah, it's a little tricky. Do you ever worry about um, tagging the wall or, you know, how do you avoid that? Well, as soon as I heat up the clear to pull it off, I start to blow into it. So it's very thin and then just make sure that there isn't any time where it has uh, doesn't have pressure coming in from the inside. So then it mm -hmm. won't ever um, collapse. But it happens, but then it ends up being such a thin piece of clear, you can basically just melt it in or pull it off. It only really, yeah. if you have a bubbles underneath it, is the only time it really needs to even be like pulled off of there. So I don't know. Um, it's funny how you might do something like a thousand times, and then one day you just come up with a way that maybe only saves you a couple minutes, but like over the years, it's gonna be a lot. I do a lot of those little cup flips, you know. So if it, uh -huh. if I do it five times in a day, and it saves me five minutes each time, then Pretty soon, you know, you got an extra half an hour, an hour built kind of uh, out of your process. So. Yeah, so I'm um, putting together some radicello tubing here. I was shaping some components, but I need a little bit more uh, Is tubing that a, to finish up. The, yeah. Oh, that's. I thought that was a solid rod. That's a little small tube. So you're going to sleeve another tube over that one now? Uh, yeah, so that's the inner tube of a Raticello. And if you guys want to know more about Raticello tubing, there's definitely some other videos where I, I go over it uh, really precisely. But I'm just making a little piece. I need a, a narrow oh, piece. I like how you do that yeah. sleeve like that. I've never seen that done that way. I mean, there's tons of different ways to sleeve. Sure. And, um, oh, that's cool. I mean, they, they, a lot of, they all work. You know, you should just do what's... Uh, what's comfortable right yeah i like that yeah and then there's not a lot of waste with this you know you know um, i'm big on that too i think i like to do as little as possible use this little material and save you know like save as much as you can it adds up oh, for sure over 
you know, over yeah. the years. Yeah, and especially the time, like you were talking about earlier, right? It's like the it's it's about the time, like all those lines took time to put in there, right? Yeah. So saving the work is important. I was thinking about, I listened to a podcast um, that Joe Rogan had a guy on who's an archery instructor, and he came up with a system for archery that's all about um, a closed loop system. So a closed versus open loop in this case where, and like an open loop system is something where once you initiate a certain process, it becomes out of control and you can't stop it at any point. Or like, uh -huh. so when you're firing the bow, the idea is that you're never just yanking it and like um, allowing your nervous system to get out of control. And I think that is when I thought about that in relationship to glass, a big thing of gaining control of the glass is turning it into a closed loop system where there's no point in the process where you are unsafe or out of control you know like mm, you can, uh, because in the beginning you're like oh it's hot i can't put it down or i can't stop or i can't um yeah put it, you know what i mean and and once you learn every step is like completely in control or you have a bridge or you have a fail safe or you can put it back in the kiln or you have you know what i mean like taking it into being a closed loop system where every move is planned ahead of time and you can stop at any point like that's the way that you never break pieces because it's all closed loop system so you don't have that out of control like feeling that we all have when we're learning like because it's so hot and goopy and it flops around <laughs> well you didn't like that top or what you're gonna cut that off i did cut that off i think i i cra oh yeah i cracked it i remember yeah it broke uh -huh. It totally uh, it shattered, but it didn't crack through the filicello, so I was able to just cut that piece off. You know, I believe that, yeah. like, whatever you can fix, it, nothing goes um, perfectly every time, and you have to be able to go back and, like, fix what you can, um, you know? And this one, I was able to get it looking perfect again i mean there's a lot of times if you see now you can see here that this is the repaired piece mm -hmm. and the termination just has to be redone and certain things if you don't panic again like we were talking about the closed and open loop system if you have a plan and a process and you don't lose control of it it either can be fixed or it's completely until it's completely beyond hope it can be fixed. Yeah. And you know when, you know, you get there and it explodes and flies everywhere or, you know, if it doesn't come out looking perfect, then you just do it again. But it's always worth trying to fix things, I think. Ah, uh, for sure. So when you're designing a recycler, you know, and for these guys who are watching this, they're thinking about making their own. Uh, what do you think some important things to remember when you're when you're doing that especially for the first time you know um just bridge everything so anytime you're adding components that float or components that are any type of weld that's at an angle where you're not able to move the two sides in that smooth lathe like spinning motion where you basically have total on axis um, parallel between your right and left hand you're just gonna have to add bridges get more comfortable at doing using gravity to bend your tubes instead of forcing them so if you can at any point bridge a tube at both ends like for your drains or for your uptakes and then mm -hmm. allow slow enough heat just don't overheat things and then allow gravity to form the bends and adjust any things that's out of angle like at all cost sure. avoid your jerky pushing and pulling on it with your hands yeah. and paddles and stuff yeah. um, that's one thing and just keep in mind that it takes some 
getting used to to figure out the function that people want and that's definitely um that's important and it's worth you know really getting to know your customers and finding out who they are and what their experience that they're looking for is and how the end product is going to be used and what the water level is going to be and how it's going to function with the carb cap on it you should you know if you don't dab you should like have someone test your recyclers for you and see does it do what i want it to do when it's actually being used you know because there i've had that happen where i sold a piece and i was like oh yeah it works great with like without a banger in it and without a cap on it and without you know what i mean when you're not actually using it but then someone might be unhappy with it because they're actually trying to function have it function the way that they want so that's important you know just staying humble and trying to give people what they want you know because mm-hmm. it does have a utility um needs to be nice to use so that color that you're using is, is calypso it's a pretty interesting color uh it's one of my favorites but it's it's sometimes a little bit tricky compatibility wise so it's cool to uh to see this being used because they're not a lot of applications where where i could trust it you know sure if you're making like um lay, layered tubings or st- line yeah. uh, line tubing or stuff like that or marinis exactly. do you make a lot of marinis i saw your shelf with all the boxes that you had that's really cool that you kept all those yeah i love making marinis it's one of my one of my favorites in glass i'm teaching a a workshop in march called marini madness and uh i'm gonna be yeah it's an in-person class and we're going to be doing marinis maybe for like beginners or people who haven't done it much and we'll make some simple simple shapes and kind of talk about like component building and stuff like that beautiful do you use a vacuum when you build your marinis always no, no i don't because there's a couple methods to marinis one is the Franchini method which is the sculpting yeah uh, which is what yeah. i do and then there's like a stringer stack and that and that one you need a vacuum sure but, sure but yeah i did kind of i guess now that you think mentioned that i i haven't had any like teaching in marinis but the last one that i i've played with a few i did kind of a combination of those two i think i started with the core and sort of sculpted that and then formed sticks around the ed- the sides of that and kind of kept on building it in a little bit of a random sort of way but yeah i'd love to learn more about it maybe i'll take your uh any class today. come out and hang out with me while i'm teaching you can you can uh assist and help the students with it <laughs> yeah that'd be fun um, it's so- it's marines are so fun though it's one of the most magical techniques yeah. i think that and you get to crack them open they're like little christmas presents you know every time <laughs> yeah yeah that is true so what's the what's the trick to encasing something in glass like a little sculpture like this? Well, the it it's tricky. There's depending on the shape of it. Um, again, like bridging, you have to figure out a way to bridge it. Um, I've changed how I do this around a few times depending on what the final application will be and what sides you want to be facing which directions. Um, but you just have to figure out a way to bridge it, basically. Like anytime you see someone that has welded something inside of another tube, like one of those little spinners that people do, or like um, a sculpture inside of a tube or something like that, either you have to have two points of contact welded onto it at some point because uh-huh. that's the only, at least that's the only way I can really see it successfully being done but maybe with a lathe you could do some things where you have it sort of floating but i just what was it like using um this radicello tubing like i when i look at that after i make it i think wow that's that must be so easy and smooth to use because it's got this lattice pattern holding it together 
but I don't really find it easier. But what do you think? Uh, how how is using the radicello tubing? It's very similar to using like a filicello section because you have you have the lattice pattern to kind of show your eyes whether it's straight or not. It's tricky to, yeah. but you can also use that as a reference. I never thought about it actually holding the shape though, but I bet it does. And at least make stiffer than the clear. I mean, for sure. Like, wouldn't it make sense, right? If you think totally, about it, totally yes. But like, especially if you put black in lines or something in there, yeah. even the white though, yeah. definitely, it's got. Yeah, as long as it's very even. But if you had, because yeah, that makes sense. It would. Yeah. So, that's a pretty cool tattoo that you have there on your right arm. It looks fresh. Thanks. Yeah, I got that in Australia while I was on my trip from an artist that I wanted some work from for years and finally made the trip over there. Got uh, got some work from him, which was exciting. Um, I think. What's it like to get a tattoo where you don't know that it's a black white tattoo? Oh, so yeah. <laughs> I don't know. It was a little weird. I was like, man, you didn't... You know, to ask me, like, what if uh, that ink is, like, you know, has some chemicals in it or something, but it's cool. I don't know. It's kind of funny. It's like, it reminded me of doing a dab rig with, like, some UV in it and not telling the person, which I've done that before. So I guess, you know, here you go. Yeah. <laughs> Surprise. Did you have you showed that off to anybody, the black light stuff, since you've been here? No, I haven't. I've just been waiting for the right time where, like, at a party or something, when they have one, and uh -huh. it'll just kind of, like, you know. Uh -huh. You forgot about it. I, I'm not going to forget about it. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Sam came with the tattoo. It was clearly fresh, and uh, the color looked so UV reactive to me. I was like, dude, I think you, I think you got a UV tattoo, man. He's like, I don't know. I don't, I, okay, let's check. You know? <laughs> and I was like, okay. So we shine the light on this tattoo, and lo and behold, UV reactive. Funny. All right, so now we're cutting off the I don't even channel. go to raves anymore, so it's like, it's almost useless. Well, that's the problem. You need to start going again. Yeah. All right, so now are you making the drain, a drain here, or what are you making? Uh, this looks like it's going to be the, the top... Um, funnel section like the Coriolis chamber I think they call it I'm not familiar with uh, the hydrodynamic terms or whatever that people typically use but yeah this is going to be the the drain and the uh, the funnel piece so you basically just want to make a nice tapered shape bring that down and then uh then you'll have like a funnel shape yeah. you can use for that. And the splash guard at the top is important. So you'll see a lot of recyclers have the funnel shape and then they have an additional little hollow section directly above that with a slightly wider lip than the neck will have. And that's just because if the neck of your tube will build up... Um, Oh, the word is it, escaping my mind. The, the surface tension of the water will carry water up into the neck and the mouth into your mouth if you don't have a little mm -hmm. bit of wider place at the top of your funnel where that surface tension that can't sense. connect and it yep. falls back down. So just keeps a little yeah, bit of those splashes sense. from like sucking up into your mouth. It's pretty key. Yeah. Um. What about for, for uh, work-wise, people getting into the industry, do you go to trade shows or how, do you just mostly sell your stuff on Instagram to collectors? When I was first starting out, I like the first couple of years, I think it was probably a year before I sold anything really. And then I just went around to my local head shops, you know, I was making my spoons, making my little <laughs> pieces and whatever I could do, bubblers and stuff back then. and. Um, yeah, just going door to door, knocking, uh, bringing my case in, and sometimes I had maybe a little sob story about like need gas money or something, which was true because I was broke and I needed, you know, like to eat or whatever, and they'd uh, take pity on me every now and again, buy a little bit of stuff, and then Instagram kind of came into my uh, world 
view and I started seeing the artists that were getting big on there. It had been going on for a while before I kind of like caught on to the wider scene. Just I was from, I'm from Montana and we were just kind of doing our little local thing. And then I started seeing all these people. I was like, whoa, this guy, uh, you know, like Adam Reitz was the person I saw doing fillas first who like inspired me so much and then i saw yushin's um demo that he did on your youtube channel and then so really the internet kind of like connected me once i found that and then i made an instagram and then started posting stuff um that really connected me and gave me the independence to just make like my own stuff i did work at a shop for a while that took half my work half of everybody's work there um and that guy was like a total loser who ran that place um i won't call him out but i would love to be hilarious but every, anybody around here knows who he is but he was just so i got ripped off and like you know one of those kind of things where you you live and you learn you find your your ways but yeah now i pretty much uh sell everything on instagram i've gone to trade shows before wholesale and like proto and all that just doesn't work for me that well i don't handle the like pressure so much of that i guess as much as i like just making what i want to make and maybe what i make today and tomorrow and the next day might all be different and not just having to like um produce and um mm -hmm. the incentives i guess are different somehow and it doesn't seem to lend me to do my best work um, for wholesale. Plus, I've just been building up a direct-to-consumer market for myself so I can sell my work and then um, just connect with people. And uh, <clears throat> What was the Illuminati like working? Was that pretty soft? Oh, yeah. It was really nice. Beautiful color. Yeah. Yeah. So we're putting together things pretty fast here at this point. You have the the sphere on there with the hummingbird um, and now attaching some Illuminati to that. Um, what what about reheating and, and annealing the piece at these stages? Do you you like to use the torch as an annealing flame or a Bunsen or? I like to know, use the studio? torch as much as I can because uh, the torch is a little hotter. It Here's a Jesus seal for you guys to see. Let's check this out. A little Jesus seal. Yeah, that's another trick if you're learning recyclers that's invaluable to learn. You can practice with clear tubing. You probably have a, a lesson on that, I would wager. Um, yeah, that's a key yeah, we do. move for sure. It's really easy, and uh, doing little tubulations is another one that's also really handy where you blow out a hollow section of rod um and you can learn a ton about just the way glass works by practicing those two techniques are really eye-opening too they expand your kind of uh knowledge of what the rules are and and all that so um how long do you think this piece took you total to or like how long would a piece like this take you if you did all the prep work too and and you know sometimes it'd probably take, take me two days i usually go. spend a couple of days on one um if i do one day all of your filicello sections and then all of the tubing and um color blowouts or coil pots or whatever i might be mm -hmm. doing for that And who do you credit with bringing the recycler into uh, the glass pipe world? I don't even, I have no idea. It was around when I like showed up when you started on the that, internet. Yeah, Not when I first started, like 2000. Oh yeah, probably was like 2012. Oh yeah, definitely. there was recycle. Like I said, I was just, I didn't, I wasn't online. I just was doing like, I learned to blow glass first from a hippie that I met at like a music festival and I didn't even believe in smartphones or any of that. I was just like, uh, yeah, doing my little local thing here. So I don't really know what was all going on. Who do you credit with the 
bringing the recycler. Probably oh. Sovereignty, I guess, would be the one who I think made it. Oh, first. really? Huh. That would make sense. Sovereignty. Yeah. Um, I I mean, it's hard to say. I say that was probably like 2010. Okay. Something yeah. like that. Nine. 10, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Everything and, I remember. Uh, it was the male joints and the titanium uh-huh. and. Uh, Red hot dabs, just hotter than the devil. Red hot, yeah. Oh, it's just so hot, just hot. Oh, God, horrible. (laughs) Everybody's making like hash oil in their garage with, you know, like their grandma's baking trays or whatever. Sorry, grandma. The the glory days, the glory days. (laughs) Um. So you got the piece here, making making some connections and and building this up. Um, if you guys try to make a recycler, please tag us in it. We'd love to see what you do and uh, how the video inspired you to to make some work. Um, we'd love to see it. Yeah, definitely. I would say one other thing about the making a recycler is to make all of your parts first and then put it together because once you go into your assembly phase, it's really uh, a drag to have to go back into your prep phase and like, oh, I didn't make enough tubing to do all my drains and stuff. And then you got to switch modes from assembly to coil pot mode again and like taking all that cognitive load and putting it in um, those different kind of uh, compartments, I guess, or you know what I'm talking about, like just making absolutely sure you got extra prep, then, you know, take how much you think you might need and then add like 25% to account for mistakes or uh, just underestimating a little bit of waste here and there. So then you're like cruising on your assembly and you don't have to go back. There we go. We're getting pretty close now, Sam. Yeah. Got the, the basic tape. And we're going to go in and do the perk and attach the joint and stuff. Yep. Huh? There's just a pretty basic little sucked in nubbin kind of perk here with some poked holes that I like to do sometimes. I think it works just as well. Talk about the tungsten. This, this is a technique that, that hasn't been shown very much on my channel. Um, with the tungsten and poking holes. Yes, it's a little tricky. You have to not overheat the tungsten, I think is the main mistake that people will make. And the glass has to be slightly glowing and the tungsten has to be also slightly glowing as little as possible so you don't make a big big mess and leave a bunch of tungsten inside the glass. But Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah, that was a one of those early ones that I learned, I think, poking holes and bales for pendants and stuff, too. So you also have a background a little bit in Julie. You're one of the only other people. There may be a couple, but you're one of the only people I've seen who combines uh, your own jewelry fabrication with your own glasses. Yeah, same to you, man. And I, I really like that about your work also. It's a lot of fun. Yeah it's pretty unique right it's cool cool to do some mixed media stuff and make some jewelry and and treat our glass components like the gems of the jewelry you know it is well yeah and and, and you know um the marinis that you make like you i saw those rings that you did those are fantastic yeah. uh, marinis are such good little uh good little gems yeah yeah they are they are what, so what's your plan this year? What are you going to be making? Is it more? Are you going to go jewelry or rigs or what's the direction? Both. I think I'm going to keep doing my hummingbird feeder series. It seems to be going well and uh, just try to establish that kind of product a little more and continue that series and develop it as much as I can. Marinis are also something that I've really, really enjoyed. That's been fulfilling um and then the jewelry yeah i'm going to grs in kansas to take an engraving class in may so that will be pretty sweet and get um a little more serious about that so yeah it should be fun wow awesome um 
GRS, they make tool and mounts and things like that for jewelers. Um, it's a, it's a, most people have this bracketing and this mounting system on their, on their bench. It's a really good system. The GRS. Yeah. System. And they're gravers. They make tons of, tons yeah. of stuff. And, um, yeah. they have some really good teachers there too. So it should be great. Get a little bit of, you know, you need quality instruction. I think if it's available and you'll, you can just get way ahead by, taking classes and so it's so cool that you do what you, if you do. guys are interested in yeah if you guys are interested in jewelry and combining the two um there's a project that i'm just launching it's um it's here at the studio there's also a jewelry studio but we're kind of combining everything under one one roof and we have some really exciting master jewelers coming out um already scheduled so there's there's a class in may and uh, check that out it's you can find a link we're not exactly sure the name but you know you can find a link on my website uh or in the description here um we're calling it revere studio at the moment but uh, it's the combination of the jewelry and the, the glass cool together. yeah i think that's gonna yeah. be a big um the big thing going forward just because of the the possibilities are well, and, and it's not only going forward but bringing something into the pipe making world i guess that's already been around for so long you know but so few yeah. people actually have totally. both skill sets and you know it, it's very cool yep yeah you should definitely uh when you come out we'll play around we'll make something so making the joint last couple steps right uh yep one of the yeah. last Put the joint, I finished my joints on a cold seal um, rather than a mm -hmm. plug just because I think it's way better. And so you're going to heat this up and then pop it off and remelt it and shape it a little bit? Yeah. So then I, I go into the cold seal because I can use that side for my blow tube now and then finish shaping my um, the bottom of the weld where the joint will attach to the piece there we go just attach that push and pull just a little bit and then you're going to attach that for a bridge so that you can melt in that that joint right to where it needs to be yeah again and so, do you so have... I, I go to the big flame between every weld to let the bridge cool down enough to hold it still. And then I go back and keep the whole piece warm while I wait for that. And then I go back and finish each one. So as you're building something like a recycler, if you do that same process in between each one of your welds and make sure that you're not skipping that step, it's very easy to build complex pieces because there's no point when it's getting cooled down too much or you're not doing too many moves at once. You just do this minimal amount that you can in the fewest number of steps that you can in order to progress. Yeah. And then you go on to the next phase, just one at a time, nice and slow and steady and controlled. And then, you can just keep going and that's how people build you know those really complicated things is just one little small step at a time well i think a lot of people would look at this i think and say this is a really complicated thing it is a little complicated uh, yeah <laughs> i think most people i think most people <laughs> even most class artists so I think there's only I think only because you understand this really well and there's some people who do but uh I think it becomes less complicated the more you understand it. But, but this appears complicated. <laughs> it's a to combination most, I'm sure. of a lot of. I think most complicated pieces are probably, if you would, I don't know, you might you might not agree with this, but most complicated pieces are simple components just repeated and added together in more extensive Absolutely. ways, like the basic yeah. thing is just ends up being more work and becoming more confident in your process so that you can put that much more work into it without having those mistakes and failures that are so brutal, but you just have to go through. 
yeah so here's the piece we're grabbing out of the kiln and you guys can check this out um everything is kind of ready to go we're just going to wipe it off and then use the kevlar to hold it and pull off the the bottom blow tube try to get that termination right and this is illuminati so this this really popped under a black light we'll show you guys uh we'll show you guys it at the end but but it was super cool to to find a use for this illuminati, illuminati tubing that we made so many years ago yeah it was really nice i don't i often get the chance to use like hand pulled crucible tubing from someone who i actually know that batched it and made it all yeah. from scratch so it was really cool to use so here you guys you can see the piece and you can see uh the radicella tubing and the hummingbird encasement and um check out the way that this functions with the drains and all of the lines between the reticello that dustin made and the filicello that i did the lattice pattern really combines to make a beautiful effect no matter where you look on this piece your eyes are never bored or empty 